and the researchers together trying to promote the growth and understanding of the knowledge in these two uh, domains. So uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce our IDS, IIDS team member to you all first. Dr. Alex Chen from Hong Kong Student University. He is our principal investigator, Alex Chen. And then our uh, co-principal investigator, Dr. Leo Lai from Open University of Hong Kong. And then our co-principal investigator from Christian, uh, Gracia Christian College, Dr. Lufana Lai. And there are actually two absentees uh, today due to uh, some family issues and uh, uh, problems. They are uh, Dr. Bat Lam from uh, the Hong Kong Polytechnic Universities and Dr. Raymond Choi from Hong Kong Student Universities. And I'm one of the team members, Dr. Nicholson Seal. Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, today. And now uh, I would like to uh, introduce our department head of uh, the, the Department of Psychology, uh, Counseling and Psychology, Dr. Alex Lee, to present a speech. And we would like uh, to invite him to present a little souvenir to uh, Dr. Kelly first. Dr. Kelly and Dr. Lee, please. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Lee, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, today is our great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Kelly Muscatel uh, to uh, give us a three-day course, not only today, it's for this week, <laughs> from, starting from today. Uh, Dr. Kelly is an uh, prof assistant professor uh, uh, at the University of North Carolina. Uh, she is also the director of the Social Neuroscience and Health Laboratories. Uh, her research interest um, is uh, in uh, how social support and social stress affect uh, brain and the body, and also the roles of physiologists in emotion and also social lives. Uh, her three days course is about uh, how to apply uh, positive neuroscience in designing evidence-based mental health practice. And to start with, uh, tonight's talk is about social and affective neuroscience contributions to understanding of well-being. So without further ado, uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Kelly Muscatel. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today. I really appreciate you being here despite the weather and the late hour. Um, I'm very excited to be in Hong Kong. It's my first time visiting, so thank you for having me. Um, and to be delivering this short course on how we can apply positive neuroscience in designing evidence-based mental health practice. Um, Um, so to start off, I wanted to say thank you very much um, to the team here for inviting me, for having me, especially to Alex for, for organizing my visit um, and for inviting me to be here to share my research with you. And then I also wanted to thank um, a number of members of the lab that I was a PhD student in back um, at UCLA. Um, so my PhD mentor, uh, Dr. Naomi Eisenberger, who is here, um, and then two other former PhD students who have now moved on to other things whose work I'll also be discussing during my short course, um, Janine Dutcher, who is here, and Tristan Inagaki, who is here. And these um, amazing group of scientists really have influenced me in the way that, that I think about um, my research. So I owe them a huge debt of gratitude and you'll hear a lot about their work over the next three days as well. Okay, so to start off, I just thought I would tell you a little bit about me and my academic journey. So um, I did my BA in psychology and Spanish from the University of Oregon. Um, and I started college as a chemistry major. Um, and then I took my first psychology course. And I realized that um, you know, we could apply the same 
um, scientific principles that I was learning about in my chemistry classes to understanding things that I thought were much more interesting than, than atoms, which are people. Um, so that led me to become a psychology major. And actually the first study that I ever worked on as an undergraduate research assistant was a neuroimaging study. So that really was my entry into trying to understand the brain and the role that the brain plays in um, helping and hindering our well-being and our physical health. Um, so after college, I completed my uh, PhD in social psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and there, my research interest really developed into um, trying to understand how our social experiences, both positive and negative, influence the brain and influence the body in ways that can influence our, our health and well-being. So my training is really interdisciplinary, based in psychology, but also so in neuroscience and also to some degree in health and medicine, trying to sort of um, bring all of these fields together to really understand uh, the human experience. I completed uh, postdoctoral training at UC Berkeley, and then I uh, started two years ago as an assistant professor um, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where, as um, Alex said, I'm the director of the Social Neuroscience and Health Lab. This is my uh, crew has been helping me out with my research, and they're all um, amazing young scientists who I think will go on to do great things. So that's a little bit about me. Um, before I dive into the science, I wanted to um, give a brief disclaimer, which is um, that the title of the grant uh, that um, funded me to come out here really emphasizes this idea of a dialogue, right? So the title of the grant is Positive Neuroscience, a dialogue between scientists and practitioners. And I really do want this to be a dialogue. So I certainly can tell you what I know about positive neuroscience, about the brain, about how um, our social experiences can influence our health and well-being. But I would also love to hear from you based on sort of your experiences in your own research or in your own professional lives, how scientists can address issues that you see coming up um, in your daily life. So please feel free to interrupt me. I know that might not be the culture here, but I am totally fine with it. Um, you know, raise your hand, um, ask questions. I would love for this to be, be a dialogue and a discussion um, so we can really delve into the heart of some of these issues. Okay, so given that we'll be talking a lot about the brain and about neuroscience over the next three days, I thought we should start off by talking about why would we even care about neuroscience, right? Why would we spend all of the time and the money to try to understand the super complicated inner workings of the human brain. Um, so this is just a, a brief comic that makes me laugh um, because uh, I think it's really true um, that that really, you know, when we're trying to understand psychology and um, human behavior, what we're really trying to understand is the brain. Right? All of our social, all of our emotional, all of our um, behaviors have their roots in, in the brain. And so really um, to have a full understanding of psychology and human health and behavior, we, we need to understand the brain. We need to consider what's going on in the brain during our um, social psychological experiences. Also, um, in terms of the more applied relevance, neuroimaging tools can help us to identify how different psychological processes work um, and really give us some insight into the basic mechanisms that give rise to our psychological experiences. And this can be useful for a number of different reasons. So first and foremost, if we understand what's going on in the brain during a psychological process, we might be able to use that knowledge to identify novel targets for intervention that we couldn't pick up on if we didn't use these neuroimaging tools to really try to understand what's happening under the skull. I also think neuroimaging can be really useful for helping us to understand how our interventions are working. 
So a lot of times when we're trying to intervene to improve someone's health or someone's well-being, we uh, do these interventions where we throw lots of different experiences at people, right? We're just trying to improve, improve their functioning. Um, and by looking at what changes in the brain as a result of those experiences, um, we can get sort of a better understanding of how our interventions are working. And that can help us to refine our inter interventions to be potentially even more effective if we understand how they're operating at the level of the brain. So I think there are some really good reasons to utilize neuroscience and to try to incorporate neuroimaging tools and to understand both positive and negative human experiences. However, I also want to point out there, there are some limitations, like any method of, of scientific inquiry of neuroimaging approaches. And I think they're really important to be aware of as you're um, consuming neuroimaging research. So we should be aware of uh, the many limitations of neuroimaging. And specifically, um, what I'm going to focus on in my talks over the next three days is this neuroimaging technology called functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI for short. So one major limitation of, of fMRI research um, is that we have really small sample sizes. So doing MRI scanning is quite expensive. At my university, it costs 500 US dollars an hour um, to use this machine. And so whereas if we're giving people questionnaires or having them do tasks on a computer, we can get very large samples of individuals to participate in our studies. You'll see throughout my talks over the next few days that with fMRI research, we usually have quite small samples of between 20 and 50 individuals. So this isn't going to necessarily be representative of the whole population. Another important limitation is that we've typically relied on samples of convenience, meaning um, individuals who we can easily access, who um, we can get to enroll in our studies. So for a lot of the research in the US, this means undergraduate students, right? So we advertise our studies around our universities, and we get undergraduate students to participate in them. Um, and that has its limitations, right? Um, 20 year olds are not always representative of the entire population. So I think it's also important to be aware um, of those um, limitations. Another uh, major factor is that um, an MRI scanning environment is highly constrained. So can I get a show of hands? How many people here have had an MRI scan? Anyone? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for those of you who have, you know this, for those who haven't, basically you're lying on this bed that gets slid into this like narrow tube. Um, it's dark, it's cold, it's really loud. Um, so the machine makes a ton of noise. And if you're trying to understand social processes or sort of how does the brain um, compute social information, you're basically taking a person and putting them in the most asocial environment, right? They're lying there for the most part on their own in the dark, in the noise. Um, so the, the methods that we have to study social experiences are also limited. Um, this, I think, is one of the things that I like the most about the type of research that I do, is trying to come up with creative ways of how do we make uh, meaningful social experiences in this very constrained MRI scanning environment. But you'll see throughout the next few days that, that the methods that we have for creating those experiences are limited. We can't have people you know, having a conversation or sitting around and, and talking with each other about issues. Um, so, so there are some, some major limitations there as well. Also, and I can't stress this enough, just because we can show where something sort of happens in the brain doesn't necessarily mean that it's useful for advancing our psychological science. So it could be useful for advancing neuroscience and telling us something about how the brain works, but just because I can show you, oh, when you're thinking um, 
about, you know, your partner or your mom, this is the part of the brain that's active. That's not necessarily that useful. And I think we need to be careful about um, not just doing neuroscience for the sake of doing neuroscience, but really asking questions um, where the neuroimaging tools can be useful for advancing our knowledge of neuroimaging and of psychology. Okay, but all that to say, um, I think neuroimaging and neuroscience can be very useful for advancing psychological science, for advancing our, our um, interventions, for helping us create evidence-based mental health practice. So I'm going to talk a lot about it over the next few days, but I did want to start by saying, you know, there are these limitations and we should be aware of them um, when we, we take this uh, research in. Okay, so that's um, sort of a broad introduction to the course over the next few days. Um, so for today, I'm really going to focus on um, social and affective neuroscience and their contributions to understanding well-being. So here's a brief outline for what we'll go through tonight. So I'm going to start off, um, even though this is a positive neuroscience uh, group and a positive neuroscience grant, talking about some things that aren't so positive. Um, this is a lot of my own research where I've been focused on trying to understand um, the neural mechanisms that underlie socioeconomic disparities um, in health and how stress and social stress in particular is represented by the brain and affects the immune system. Okay, so part one will focus a little bit more on the negative side of things. Then for part two, um, we'll flip to the good news or the more positive side of things and talk about how we can potentially use the knowledge that we gained from this neuroscience research to inform interventions to try to reduce disparities um, in health and well-being. And then also how positive social experiences and social support can buffer against the negative consequ consequences of stress. Um, and I'm hoping there will be time for uh, question and answers and discussion at the end and again throughout, so please don't hesitate to, to interrupt if you have a question or if you um, want to talk about something or have an idea about how this relates to your own life or um, your own work. Okay. Um, so to start off with, uh, let's talk about the neural stress mechanisms that may underlie socioeconomic disparities in mental and physical health. So my interest in this research um, really started because of decades of work in the U.S. documenting this gradient in health outcomes that maps onto socioeconomic status, meaning education, income, occupation. So here's a graph um, that's a little confusing, so I'll walk you through it. Um, but what we have here is socioeconomic status. I'm going to say SES um, for short. And again, this is usually measured by education, someone's at level of education, someone's uh, level of income, their occup the prestige of their occupation, sometimes their subjective perceptions of where they stand. Um, we'll get to that in a second. And then um, what we have on the, the y-axis here is um, risk of chronic disease. So of osteoarthritis, of a number of chronic diseases, of hypertension or high blood pressure, and even of cervical cancer. And what you can see here is that individuals who are lower in SES, so individuals who have lower levels of education, make less money, have less prestigious jobs, are more likely to suffer from these chronic diseases than individuals who have higher levels of education, more income, um, more prestigious jobs. Now, this increased risk of chronic disease translates into, unsurprisingly, an association with mortality. So individuals with lower levels of education, lower income, um, worse occupations tend to die at an earlier age than individuals with higher SES. 
Um, so not a very pleasant picture. These are data from the US, um, but as I was preparing for and thinking about this talk, um, I was curious if you had similar um, issues to grapple with here in Hong Kong. Um, and it turns out you likely do. Um, but before we get to that, I thought um, in, your, in your course materials, um, we could go through uh, an example of a way that we commonly measure people's subjective perceptions of their social status. So if you turn to pages two and three um, in your course materials, you'll find these two ladders, pictures of two ladders. I put the instructions on the top. So let's take a second, read through them, and just complete this exercise, sort of think about where you feel like you stand in Hong Kong society. I'll give you a couple minutes to work on that. All right, I'm not going to collect them from you or anything, but um, I so these are the um, two very commonly used ways of measuring people's subjective perceptions of their social status or their social class. Sort of where do they think they stand in a hierarchy representing their state or their country or their city or more locally in their community. And interestingly, people's perceptions of where they stand are often better predictors of their health than even their objective levels of education or income. So really sort of how you feel about your standing in society is a really important predictor of health and well-being. Um, so here are some data um, from a recent paper on socioeconomic status and mental health and the gradient here in Hong Kong. And I know this is a little hard to read, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that once again, we see this um, strong gradient where individuals in, in Hong Kong um, with lower levels of education, lower levels of income, um, and who perceive themselves as um, having lower standing in Hong Kong and in the community are more likely to have higher levels of depressive symptoms than individuals who are from higher social class backgrounds. So again, just to say that you know this is an important phenomenon if we're trying to promote health and um, well-being and thriving for individuals across all of the different socioeconomic status groups. Um, the individuals in, in the lower status communities are really suffering from poor health and poor mental health at a greater rate. Now, interestingly, um, in my subfield of social psychology, there's been sort of a more recent literature that's been investigating how socioeconomic status influences the way individuals behave in social interactions. Um, so some recent findings, again, this is within the US, suggest that lower SES individuals might be more communally oriented. So more likely to think about themselves in relationship to others, more sort of interdependent, see themselves 
through their relationships with other people and their community. And as a result of that, um, we have this whole smattering of findings that basically suggest that lower SES individuals are more um, socially engaged. So um, this was a really cool study where they brought two individuals into the lab, one higher SES, one lower SES, and they had them just have a conversation with each other and they videotaped it. And afterward, they went through and they coded the videotapes for um, cues of social engagement, um, which in this case were things like nodding and smiling and sort of indicating that, you know, the person was participating in the conversation. And then they also um, coded social disengagement behaviors. So these were things like doodling on a piece of paper or playing with your hair or sort of not making eye contact with the other person. They found that the lower SES individuals were much more likely to do the social engagement behavior, sort of indicating that like I'm here in this conversation with you, I'm participating. Whereas the higher SES individuals were more likely to be socially disengaged. So interesting. Um, lower class individuals have also been shown to be better at reading the emotions of other people. So better at understanding what another person is feeling. Um, they've been shown to actually be more, behave more ethically and be more compassionate to the suffering of others. And on the maybe not so positive side of things, the um, lower SES individuals also interpret ambiguous social stimuli more negatively. So are more likely to kind of see the negative in an ambiguous situation where it's not really clear if it's positive or negative. So I came into this literature and I, I really wondered, what are the neural underpinnings of these effects? Um, and I say mentalizing here, which is a term that we use in social neuroscience to sort of refer to this broad set of psychological processes that involve thinking about other people. So things like theory of mind or perspective taking, try to, trying to put yourself in another person's shoes and understand their perspective empathy, sort of experiencing another person's affective state. So um, those, all, those processes all rely on sort of this similar set of, of brain regions um, that we refer to as the mentalizing network. And I was basically wondering if lower SES individuals might be more likely to show activity in this network of brain regions that are important for helping us understand others compared to higher SES individuals. So these are the, the regions. Um, if you are not familiar with neuroanatomy um, and don't want to memorize all of these acronyms, that's totally fine. I'll try to talk about it um, more broadly. But for those of you who are interested, I wanted to emphasize, so um, we sort of thought there might be these, these two networks, these two sets of regions that could be important for underlying some of these uh, disparities that we see as a function of SES. So the first one is this set of neural regions that I'm showing you here in orange. Orange, um, which is this, the network that tends to be more active during tasks that involve thinking about other people. So like I was saying before, putting yourself in another person's shoes, experiencing empathy for another person is associated with activity in these orange regions. So uh, more ventral and more dorsal aspects of medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex. We also thought given these findings about um, lower SES individuals interpreting negatives, um, sorry, ambiguous stimuli more negatively, that maybe um, a set of neural regions that are involved in processing threat and attending to um, salient information in the environment, including um, the amygdala, which I'm gonna talk a lot about today, uh, the anterior insula and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex might also be important 
So we sort of thought, okay, it's maybe these two networks of regions, one involved in mentalizing or thinking about others, one involved in processing threat and salience that could um, vary as a function of SES and sort of contribute to these more positive effects of being more social, but also kind of the negative outcomes associated with health. Okay, so to address this question, we um, ran two initial studies. Um, in our first study, we bought, brought 16 healthy undergraduate students at UCLA into the lab, and we showed them, um, we asked them to complete a measure not unlike the one that I just had you complete, um, and we told them, okay, this is a ladder, it represents uh, UCLA, your, your university, um, at the top are the people who are the best off, at the bottom are the people who are the worst off, um, indicate where you think you stand on this ladder. So this was our measure of their subjective perceptions of their social status in their university community. We then took these individuals and we put them in the MRI scanner, like I mentioned before, um, and we tracked basically uh, what functional MRI is doing is tracking where blood is flowing in the brain. And the idea is there should be more blood flowing to regions that you're using more, right? Because you're using up the oxygen in your um, blood cells and so you need more blood to go to that area. So if we see greater blood flow into that um, region that we know or we infer that you're probably using it more. Um, so we scanned these individuals using fMRI and during the MRI scan we had them complete two different types of trials. So first they completed um, what we called social trials. So they would see, um, this is one example, so they would see an image of a person who's around their age and they would read a passage that this person supposedly wrote. So this person says, I'm excited to go to lunch um, with my friend because I haven't seen her in a while. So um, just a sort of regular description of something a person could be feeling. So we measured where, um, how, what, what brain regions were active in response to these types of trials compared to what brain regions were active in response to these types of trials. So this is a really important part of fMRI research, is designing your control conditions so that they really match up with your experimental condition that you really care about. So you know that whatever region you're seeing is more active is active due to the process that you care about. So as you can see in our non-social trials, we again showed people an image. This time, instead of a person, it's an object. But we know that any differences we see in the brain in response to these different types of um, trials isn't due to seeing a picture, because you see a picture in both of them. And they read a description of this, of this object. So this one says, the power stick charges via a mini USB connector that the user connects to the gadget. So on both sets of trials, they're seeing an image. They're reading a description, but in this case, it's about a person, so more likely to engage thinking about this person's thoughts and feelings. And in this type of trial, they're not thinking about a person, right? It's just about an object. So what we did was we said, okay, what parts of the brain are more active during these types of trials compared to these types of trials? that also are associated with individuals' perceptions of their social status. So basically, what regions are uh, varying as a function of individuals' status? So here's what we found. We found that there was this set of brain regions that was more active in response to the social information trials that was especially more active for individuals who are lower in social status. So to orient you to this graph, we have social status here. This is people's ratings of where they thought they fell on that ladder measure. And we have the MRI signal from these three regions here. And as you can see, there's this nice negative association, right? So people who are lower in social status showed greater activity in these regions compared to individuals who were higher in social status who showed less activity in these regions. 
Why do we care? Why is this interesting? Well, these are neural regions that are involved in mentalizing or involved in thinking about other people's thoughts and feelings. So even though we haven't explicitly instructed them to take the other person's perspective or experience empathy for them, these lower status individuals are sort of naturally bringing these regions online to a greater degree when they're faced with social information compared to higher status individuals. Okay, so that was interesting. It's, it was the first evidence that I know of that showed that neural activity um, was related to socioeconomic status in a social um, processing task. But we really are trying to understand health and well-being, right? And this sort of process of just thinking about another person, viewing an image of them, reading a description they supposedly wrote, isn't probably that relevant for health. So to try to get us one step closer to understanding how these processes might relate to mental and physical health, we ran a second study. So in this study, we brought 22 healthy adolescents, so these are 13-year-olds, and their parents into our lab. Um, and we started, we decided to focus on adolescents in this study because there's some really compelling research now suggesting that um, socioeconomic status and your social class early in life is a really strong predictor of future health. So even when you're you know, older and into adulthood, the, the social class that you had when you were growing up is a really strong predictor of that. So we thought we would shift a little earlier and try to understand um, how the brain um, is potentially changing or varying as a function of SES in early life. So we brought these adolescents and their parents into the lab. We asked their parents to answer these two questions about their socioeconomic status. So what is your annual household income? And what's the highest level of education achieved by um, the child's mother? This because maternal education, it turns out, is a strong predictor of kids' um, health outcomes. And then we, again, scanned the, this time the adolescents using fMRI while they viewed these negative social images, like this super angry face that you see here. Um, and we looked at um, which brain regions were more active in response to seeing these socially threatening angry faces compared to just a fixation crosshair here. And again, we were interested in not just how does the brain respond to a face like this compared to a cross, but rather how does the brain's response vary as a function of the adolescent's socioeconomic status background. So um, when we looked at regions of the brain that showed that pattern, that showed more activity to the socially threatening face, that also varied as a function of social class, um, we saw, again, this core region involved in mentalizing or thinking about others' thoughts and feelings that showed a negative association with SES. So kids, or adolescents in this case, who were from lower SES families showed more activity in this region that's involved in mentalizing in response to the social threat. Interestingly, we also saw this same pattern in uh, the amygdala. The left amygdala is shown here. This is a region that's super critical for responding to threats in the environment. Um, and again, we saw that kids from lower SES backgrounds showed more activity in the amygdala in response to these socially threatening images. So suggesting to us that during social threat processing, Adolescents from lower SES families showed greater activity in brain regions involved in mentalizing or thinking about other people's thoughts and feelings, and also in regions involved in responding to threat. Okay, so where does this leave us? What do we take home from all this? Um, this was really um, some evidence suggesting that lower family SES is associated with greater activity in threat and mentalizing neural regions among adolescents. This is the first study to show that early life 
socioeconomic status can get sort of neurally embedded in social brain systems um, and provide some additional evidence that the attention that paying t attention to other people and really awareness of other people's thoughts and feelings might be relatively automatic for lower status individuals. So even in the absence of instructions to, to try to put yourself in someone's shoes, um, individuals from lower SES backgrounds showed greater activation in these regions. Further, acti activity in these regions is linked with physiological responses to stress. So we thought maybe this is one of the neural mechanisms or one of the brain pathways by which uh, socioeconomic disparities in health may develop. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second. Any, how are, any questions? Yeah. Ah, that's a great question. So that was kind of what we did in the first study. Um, those were pretty neutral social images. They didn't show, um, we didn't find a, a um, relationship with amygdala activity in that, in, that in that study. That was just the mentalizing regions. Um, so it doesn't seem like they're activating this threat pathway in response to the, the non-threatening images. Yeah, good question. Other questions about this set of studies? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great. I, I, I'm a clinician. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, uh huh. Yeah, yeah. And then I find that a couple of the, those school courses are mm -hmm. much more individual-based. Yeah. talking about yeah. thinking yeah. and also achievement. Yeah, but yep. But when all the lower SES group of guys are asking about your illness, mm -hmm. the sharing. Yeah. 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 It's interesting that you're seeing it out in in yeah, your in your groups. Yeah. Sense, yeah. 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 No. Absolutely. I mean, and I think I'll get to this in a few minutes, but I think there are some really interesting implications of this for for interventions and how we design interventions and sort of. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Any other thoughts or questions at this point? Okay. Um, in that case, I'm going to move on and tell you about one more study in this area. Um, this one is very near and dear to my heart because it was my dissertation uh, research um, as a PhD student. Um, and we're going to switch gears a little bit and introduce um, another system, another biological system um, that I think is really important and really understudied and it'll come up again and again throughout my talks for the next few days. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about it here. Um, and that is the immune system and specifically the innate immune system that comes online quickly um, and is non-specific, so it's not like when you get a vaccination or an immunization, and you know you're infected with a little bit of a virus, and then your immune system builds up um, antibodies to that virus. This is a, a non-specific, fast-acting part of the immune system, the innate immune system, and specifically what I've focused on in a lot of my work is inflammation. So, um, inflammation is really the body's first line of defense against injuries or infections. Um, so we've all ha gotten a paper cut, 
right, where you sort of slice your finger on a, on a bit of paper. So when you get a paper cut, you may have noticed that the area around the cut, it sort of, after a little while, turns red. It kind of heats up. The area around the skin heats up, um, and um, it might get a little puffy. That is the inflammatory response. That is happening because these um, proteins, which I'm pointing to in red here, that are called pro-inflammatory cytokines, or cytokines for short, which are the chemical messengers of the immune system, are basically being released by immune cells. They're going to the site of the injury, in this case, the paper cut, and they're saying, hey, other immune cells, we need you to come over here and help heal this wound, help take care of this problem. So super important uh, part of the way that the body responds to injuries or infections. So interestingly, that's an example of um, acute inflammation, right? There's a problem like a cut and then these cytokines um, orchestrate this inflammatory response to try to fight off um, or heal the wound or fight off any infection. But the inflammatory response can also be systemic or sort of widespread throughout the body. So even when there's no specific cut or no, no, no specific bacteria or virus that's gotten into the body, you can have these um, systemic increases in levels of inflammation. And interestingly, what we've learned in the field of psychoneuroimmunology over the past few decades is that um, elevated levels of systemic inflammation in the body are important for lots of chronic diseases. So um, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, arthritis, um, even mental health conditions like major depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. These are all associated with elevated levels of inflammation in the body. So suggesting that inflammation might be a common pathway that could lead to both negative physical and mental health outcomes. What I think is so interesting about inflammation as a psychologist is that even in the absence of any problems, any physical problems in the body, in the absence of injury, in the absence of infection, Inflammation has been demonstrated to be elevated among individuals from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds. So no physical problems in the body, but lower SES individuals have higher levels of inflammation. And fascinatingly, levels of inflammation actually increase in response to acute stress. So if you bring someone into the lab and you have them go through a stress task where they're evaluated by other people, maybe they experience this negative self-conscious emotion of shame, you see increases in levels of inflammation in the body. So really showing that the mind, the brain, and our psychological processes can influence the immune system and lead to increases in inflammation in the body, which could put individuals on these trajectories toward negative physical and mental health. Um, but what we didn't know much about when I started this work is the neural processes that underlie these stress-related increases in inflammation. And could these neural responses during stress that link with changes in inflammation in the body contribute to mental and physical health disparities among individuals from different social class backgrounds. So that was really the question that I wanted to tackle um, in my dissertation project. Um, so to study this, um, we had to get kind of creative because as I mentioned before, the MRI scanner is super constrained environment. Normally, when we want to induce acute stress in the lab, what we do is we have people come in, we say, okay, in two minutes, you're going to have to give a speech about why you're a good candidate for your dream job. You're going to give this speech to a panel of evaluators who are trained to evaluate verbal and nonverbal behavior. 
So participants have two minutes to frantically write down their notes for their speech. Then they have to stand up and they have to deliver this speech in front of this panel of individuals wearing white coats who are not being very kind to them. They're sort of um, just staring at them very stoically. So that's normally how we induce stress in the laboratory. It's called the Trier social stress test, very commonly used. But we can't do that in an MRI scanner, right? People are lying down um, and they have to be holding still. They can't be moving. So we had to get kind of creative for how we were going to induce stress. Um, so I, I think we did an okay job, but I'll be curious to hear what you think. So, so we brought um, 31 healthy young adult women into the lab to participate in this study. Um, they had to be healthy um, and otherwise not have any um, problems that could lead to elevations in their levels of inflammation in the body. So we brought them into the lab and we said, okay, you're going to be participating in a study that's trying to understand how people respond to first impressions. When we're first meeting someone, how does the brain help us um, form impressions and how do we respond to other people's impressions of us. So what we're going to do is we're going to have you do um, an interview that we're going to videotape and we ask them in this interview pretty personal questions. So things like, what would you most like to change about yourself? Or tell me about a time when you really disappointed someone or really let someone down. And we told them, okay, you're going to be um, coming back in for a second session. And during that second session, you're going to be participating along with someone else. And we're going to choose one of you to watch the other person's video of their interview and form an impression of them based on how they're coming across in that interview. Meanwhile, the other person is going to see in real time what this evaluator's impressions of them is. So in actuality, unbeknownst to our participants, the other participant who was also involved in this study was really a research assistant who was a member of our team. And we always rigged it so that the participant was the one who had their video watched by the other person and they were scanned while they saw the other person's feedback about how they were supposedly coming across. So I'll show you in a second what this really looked like. So um, here's what happened during the study. So the participants would um, arrive. They would meet this supposed other participant called a confederate. Um, we would insert a catheter, like an IV, into their um, non-dominant forearm. And that's what we use to take blood samples, which is how you measure levels of systemic inflammation in the blood. Um, we took baseline blood samples. Then participants went through the fMRI scan, doing the task I'll show you in just a second. And then we took additional blood samples from them at 30, 60, and 90 minutes after the stressor. And this was what we used to look at how their levels of inflammation increased in response to this stressful experience. Okay, so here's what the actual setup of the task looked like. So these are images from the study. So we'd have the, the other participant who was really a member of our research team She'd be sitting out here. This is in the scanner control room. So the scanner is just behind this window here. And she's supposedly watching the participants videotaped interview on this screen and providing the person feedback about how they're coming across in the video on this screen. So we had this screen connected to um, these MRI compatible goggles that show the participant in the scanner everything that's happening on this screen. So the participants lying in the scanner and all she can see is what's going on on this screen. Okay, so let me show you what this would look like if you were a participant in this study. You're lying in the scanner, here's what you see. So you see this grid of adjectives and you see this mouse cursor that's supposedly controlled by the other person. And every 10 seconds, this mouse cursor moves around and clicks on a different adjective that supposedly describes how you're coming across. So right now, the person says, oh, you seem interesting. Before, they said, you seem sensible. Now they say, oh, you seem insecure. 
So what this allows us to do is measure how the brain is responding to receiving these different types of social feedback, positive, negative, and neutral, which overall creates this stressful experience. You're being evaluated by someone else. And so it should elicit changes in inflammation in the body. What we really were focused on in this study was um, neural responses to the negative feedback. So what happened in the brain when, when the other person told you, oh, you seem annoying, compared to neutral feedback? What happened in the brain when the person said you seem sensible? So we put the positive feedback words in there because... Partially because, at least in the U.S., it's really not common to give someone a lot of negative feedback who you've never really met before. So we thought if we only do negative and neutral feedback, which is what we cared about, people wouldn't believe it. So we had the positive words in there. Um, interestingly, I don't think people experience the positive words as very positive in this context. I think... Once you've gotten negative feedback from someone, it's really hard to shift your attention to the positive, right? We've all, I, I don't know, I, I just got my um, course evaluations for the class that I was teaching last semester, and, and they're pretty good. But of course, the ones that stick in my mind, right, are like the couple of negative ones. <laughs> so even, even in a relatively positive context, if you get negative feedback, you tend to, to sort of fixate on it. So um, positive feedback was in there, but I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so did this experience of being socially evaluated um, cause psychological stress? The answer is yes. So individuals reported feeling more negative affect or more negative emotions um, following the stressor, and they said they felt more socially rejected by the other participant following the stressor compared to before. So um, for our purposes, this is good. It says, okay, our task does seem to have made people feel more negative and more socially rejected. Next, we looked at um, individuals' inflammatory responses. So what was happening in their immune system in response to this stressor? Um, so this, what I'm going to show you here is one pro-inflammatory cytokine. It's called interleukin-6. It's one of those proteins that's the chemical messengers of the immune system. And um, we looked at people's responses. So this is their change in levels of inflammation from before the stressor to after the stressor as they related to um, their subjective feelings of their SES, that same measure that I had you complete not long ago. And interestingly, replicating prior work, we find that lower SES individuals, so people who perceive themselves as having lower standing in society, show a greater increase in levels of inflammation in response to this stressor. So it seems like their immune systems are sort of more reactive to psychological stress. Individuals from um, lower SES compared to higher SES. Um, turning to the brain, we wanted to understand how um, neural responses to this negative feedback might track with individuals' perceptions of their SES. Um, and so we focused in on neural activity um, in the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, this core region involved in mentalizing or thinking about other people's thoughts and feelings. And again, replicating our prior work, we found that individuals who are lower in SES showed greater activity in this mentalizing related neural region. Um, so it seems like perhaps what's going on here is individuals from lower SES backgrounds are thinking more about the mind of the evaluator when they're getting negative feedback. Sort of why did this person say this about me? Why do they think that I'm annoying? Compared to the higher SES individuals who don't seem to engage in that process. Um, interestingly, um, when you run a statistical test called a mediation model, which helps you to understand if um, changes in, in the brain activity are what's causing changes in the immune system, we find some evidence that this tendency of lower SES individuals to engage mentalizing-related brain regions 
during negative feedback leads to increases in inflammation. And I think this makes sense, right? If we've all had experiences, negative social experiences, where maybe for a while after or during, we're spending a lot of time thinking about the other person, right? Why is this per- why, you know, if you go on a, a first date or you, you know, are meeting someone new for the first time and you're like, what, you know, why did this person, why did they say that about me? Or what were they thinking about me? And we sort of spend a lot of time thinking about other people's thoughts and feelings. And that can really prolong the stress response um, if it's a negative social interaction and potentially lead to these increases in levels of inflammation in the body. And given that we know that it's lower SES individuals who are more likely to engage those regions and do that sort of thinking about other people's minds, this could be a mechanism, another mechanism um, that's contributing to negative mental and physical health outcomes among individuals from lower SES backgrounds. Okay, so to conclude this first part, um, we have some evidence now that lower social status is related to greater mentalizing related neural activity. And in negative social interactions, this may have physiological costs, right? It may lead to increases in levels of inflammation in the body, which is what I was studying here. So what do we do with this, right? This is, I don't know, I'm a scientist. I think it's interesting for the sake of understanding um, science and and how the brain works and how the immune system works. But um, what do we do with this knowledge? Can we leverage what we know about the fact that lower SES individuals sort of have this ability or this tendency to think about the minds of other people um, to improve their outcomes? I think we can. I'll tell you one way that we've been trying to tackle it, and I'm going to encourage you all to potentially think about other ways uh, that we could use this knowledge to improve outcomes for individuals from lower class backgrounds. Okay, so here's, here's the way that we've been tackling it. One of the ways we've been tackling it. Um, trying to design, again, evidence-based interventions, using the knowledge that we gain from this basic science about how the brain and the body work to inform our interventions. So um, one of the things we've been playing with is, is there a way that we can change really important um, psychological processes or tasks that are typically not very social to be more social so that we can improve outcomes for lower SES individuals. So I'll give you one very concrete example. In this study, we brought people into the lab and we had them do um, a basic cognitive working memory task. So working memory is your ability to um, sort of maintain and manipulate information in mind. So if you're trying to remember someone's phone number and you repeat it over and over to yourself, actually not a very good strategy, but a lot of people do it, right? Um, That's working memory. Now, Tons of research has shown that individuals who are lower in SES tend to have worse working memory. And this is a really important issue because working memory or the ability to maintain and manipulate information is critical for tons of different psychological processes in the educational context, right? If you're trying to um, be an effective learner, you need good working memory. So... What we did in this study was we measured people's cognitive working memory performance and looked at how it varied as a function of SES. And again, replicating lots of prior work, we see that higher status individuals perform better on these cognitive working memory trials compared to the lower status individuals. Okay, but we didn't stop there. We said, what if we could make this task more social? What if we could make it so that rather than keeping in mind, what they were doing in this task is keeping in mind strings of um, letters and they'd have to remember, okay, what was the one, what was the letter that occurred two ago? Was it an X or a Y? Um, What if what they were maintaining in working memory and trying to remember was social information? So now what we're doing, right, is we're, we're changing the task very slightly. It's still using working memory, but rather than remembering 
um, letters, they're remembering information about people. And if we know that lower SES individuals should be better at these tasks that involve thinking about people's minds, maybe we can improve their performance. And lo and behold, this pattern completely shifts. So now it's the lower status individuals who are performing better on this task. Again, it's a working memory task, but rather than keeping in mind digits, they're keeping in mind social information. So this is a small sample. It's one study, but I think it's intriguing. And it suggested to me, at least, a number of different ways that we could think about the way that we teach. My mom is a kindergarten teacher, so I think about uh, teaching and kids a lot. Um, the way that we teach, the way that we present information to try to improve outcomes for lower SES individuals. So here's an, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. kind of mm -hmm. like yeah yeah exactly actually what they were doing in this task was we would show them some um this is a task developed by my friend megan meyer it's totally brilliant so we would show them um or sorry, we would show them their friends' names and we would say, okay, so you see the examples of Alex, Raymond, and Serena. And then you see an adjective like fun. And you have to order Alex, Raymond, and Serena by how um, fun they are. And then we would ask you, oh, was Raymond the third most fun? So you're using working memory, but you're um, thinking about your friends' minds as opposed to digits. But yes, like w developing a story, exactly. Same kind of idea. Another question I'm mm -hmm. interested in this. Uh, some of my colleagues in uh, Calgary, uh -huh. um, they, they, they get in the early stages, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, they kind of mm -hmm. uh, to prevent. Mm. Uh, of course, they have to work with that. I want my leader. Mm -hmm. All this kind of. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting. Potentially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. I understand this is from here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot of interest in training working memory and sort of for preventing yes mental health problems but also aging right cognitive aging sort of can we train these systems yeah so yeah i do think it is it is related yeah yeah um so i'm going to skip ahead real quick and just say so one of the other ways that i've been thinking about this is is can we can we change the types of questions that we ask on our standardized tests. So in the US, the, the scholastic aptitude test, the SAT, is a really high stakes exam that basically determines sort of where you go to college. Um, and a lot of it is super dry and boring. And you're sort of reading these lengthy passages and they're testing your reading comprehension. And um, what if we, and we know that lower SES individuals tend to perform worse on these high stakes exams, what if we could make the passages that they're reading about more social? Could that boost the performance of the lower SES individuals? What if we thought about this in the way that we taught science? So I could say something totally dry, like the medial prefrontal cortex is connected to the amygdala through its dense anatomical projections. That's a fact, <laughs> um, but really non-social, right? What if I could just change it slightly 
And I could say the medial prefrontal cortex talks to the amygdala through its dense neuroanatomical projection. So it's subtle, but all of a sudden you're sort of anthropomorphizing. You're, you're thinking about these brain regions like they're, they're more human, right? And you're probably bringing online more social cognition, which could improve outcomes for individuals from lower SES backgrounds. So again, I don't know. I, I think it's an exciting new frontier. I don't, um, I would love for all of you to, to say if this rings true in your experience and, and if you think it could be effective for, for working with, with lower SES individuals, but um, I'm excited about it. Um, and I think, I think there's promise here. And so our understanding of the way in which SES influences brain development, we could use that knowledge to try to design better interventions. Um, so I was gonna give you all a brief break um, if you want one. I know I've been talking forever. Um, so I'm happy to, to chat with people um, if you want, but um, let's take five minutes, four minutes, um, use the restroom if you need to, and we'll come back for the last half that's a little more positive. Thank you. We are ready for part two, and of course I've taken too long talking about part one, so I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. But if we don't get through everything, I'll move some to tomorrow to entice you to come back <laughs> tomorrow night. Um, but for the second part um, of the talk today, I'd like to talk about um, the brain basis of uh, the positive effects of social connection and social support on health and well-being. Okay, so it probably comes as no surprise to people in this room that social connection has been discussed as a fundamental need. So much like our need for um, food, water, and shelter, we have this fundamental need to have social relationships with other people. Um, so tons of research has shown that social connection is important for our health, for our happiness, and for normal functioning in the world. Um, so these are results from a meta-analysis, basically a study of studies, um, where um, these authors compared different risk factors for mortality and sort of how strong was each of these risk factors related to mortality. And they found that social relationships or sort of the number and quality of connections that individuals have with others were very strong predictors of mortality. So individuals who lacked social connections had um, shorter lives than individuals who had strong social connections with others. So interestingly, these effects of social connection on health and longevity were even stronger than things that we think of as more traditional risk factors. So smoking, social connection is a stronger predictor of health than smoking. Um, body mass index, physical activity, alcohol consumption, sort of all of these things that we think of putting people on trajectories towards poor health, social connection is actually more strongly related to our health outcomes than these more traditional risk factors like smoking, alcohol use, sedentary lifestyle. Interestingly, this was a paper published last year in the U.S. in our flagship psychology journal, The American Psychologist, where these authors actually said, we need to advance social connection as a public health priority in the US. In the same way that we've designed these interventions to get people to not 
to quit smoking or to not start smoking in the first place. We need to design public health interventions to get people more socially connected because it is such a strong predictor of health and well-being. Um, so I want to start by talking about how we think about and define social support in this literature. So we've thought about it as the perception or experience that one is loved and cared for by others, esteemed and valued, and part of a social network of mutual assistance and obligations. So I want to point out a very important and interesting fact about the social support literature, which is that perceived social support, so your perception or experience that you're loved and cared for by others, is not the same thing as the objective number of social connections we have or the size of our social network. And most research suggests that perceptions of social connection or lack thereof, sort of feeling lonely, is far more important for health and well-being than objective number of social connections. So an individual might have one person who they consider a social support figure which by objective standards would not seem that big, but that person could rank very low on loneliness. They could feel that they get all the social connection they need from that one person. Whereas someone else might have tons and tons of social ties, people who they interact with in their family, in their friend group, in their work environment, but still feel subjectively very lonely like they're not connecting with others. And it's really the subjective perception of loneliness or of lack of social connection that matters much more than the objective. Yeah. 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 Because family can be quite sense. I mean, they can be very lonely despite the social structure, or whatever. Yeah. That would be interesting to really. Absolutely. I think that would be really interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Um. Okay, so, so um, my colleague Tristan Inagaki has been really the one who's been pioneering this work on trying to understand the neural and immunological pathways that link social support with health and well-being. I've done a little bit of, of work in this area um, in the context of cancer. So um, how does social support operate to buffer against negative outcomes for cancer patients and cancer survivors? Um, so in the context of cancer, we know that low levels of social support are linked with shorter survival time among ovarian cancer patients. So ovarian cancer patients who say they have lower levels of support um, tend to die more quickly than, than patients who say they have, have more support. Um, and then um, lower levels of social support are associated with elevated risk of breast cancer mortality following diagnosis. Um, but what are the, the neurobiological mechanisms? How do these experiences of social isolation and loneliness affect cancer outcomes? So one way that we thought um, this might happen is through um, stress and inflammation, kind of going back to the first part of the talk. So social isolation can lead to the activation of the innate immune system and lead to increases in inflammation in the body. Um, and inflammation is known to play a key role in driving cancer pathophysiology. Um, so it can facilitate metastasis, it predicts recurrence and survival among breast cancer patients. And it's also really importantly related to many of the behavioral side effects of treatment. So I think this is one of the really interesting um, conundrums that we're facing in, in cancer research these days is that um, particularly for diseases like breast cancer. Um, prognosis is pretty good. Five-year survival rate of breast cancer diagnosis in the U.S. 
is quite high. It's like 80, 85%. But um, just because someone's cancer gets cured doesn't necessarily mean that they're back to functioning the same way they were before they had cancer. And there's been a, a lot of research now about how either the cancer experience itself or some of the treatments like chemotherapy in particular um, can lead to alterations in the immune system that can, even once the person has recovered from the cancer itself, promote these negative outcomes like fatigue and chronic pain and depression that can last for a long time, even after cancer treatment. Um, so we were interested in, in trying to understand the, the sort of more upstream neural mechanisms that might link social stress and social support and inflammation, this key immune system process that's related to all these important outcomes um, in the context of cancer. And specifically, um, I'm going to skip over this because we already kind of talked about it, but basically we we're interested in um, the degree to which the brain and the immune system were sort of communicating, were talking with each other among these cancer patients. And we were targeting in this study the amygdala, this key threat region that I talked about um, at the beginning of the talk. Um, and so we were trying to understand... How was um, activation in the amygdala linked with inflammation among breast cancer survivors and healthy controls? And what role does social support play in potentially buffering these negative um, outcomes? So what are the links between inflammation, amygdala reactivity to threat, and social support in breast cancer survivors? Um, and we hypothesized that there would be um, stronger, what we called neuroimmune pipeline, or sort of stronger crosstalk between the brain and the immune system among these breast cancer survivors. But that having high social support could buffer against these negative outcomes. And that social support could lead to lower levels of amygdala activity to threat as well as lower levels of inflammation in the body. Okay, so to address this question, we recruited um, 15 early stage breast cancer survivors. Um, so these women had all um, completely completed their treatment and they were in remission. Um, and then 15 age and ethnicity matched control participants. And we had participants provide a blood sample that we assayed for levels of inflammation or inflammatory markers, um, interleukin-6, which is the same one that we had uh, measured in my previous study, and C-reactive protein, which is another commonly measured marker of inflammation. And we scanned all these individuals, again, using functional MRI, um, while they completed, completed a standard um, amygdala reactivity task. This is basically showing them threatening images, um, similar to the study that we had done with the adolescents, which is known to really elicit a strong amygdala response. Our participants also completed questionnaires, um, including this measure of, of social support that's commonly used in the literature. It's called the social provision scale. Um, so here's what the amygdala task looked like. They basically looked at these um, threatening faces one at a time, um, and they just had to press a button every time they saw a face. So this is a potent um, elicitor of activity in the amygdala. And then on other trials, they um, just had to look at a set of shapes, so as a control condition. Um, here's a social provision scale. Again, it's a commonly used way of measuring people's perceptions of social support. Um, I wanted to give you some examples of, of the types of questions that people responded to on this survey to measure their social support. Um, so there are actually six different subscales. I'm not going to go into all the details, but you can see here um, that social support is this really multifaceted construct or psychological phenomenon, right? It includes things like um, feeling attachment to others, like I have close relationships with other people that make me feel good, um, feeling socially integrated. I am with a group of people who think the same way that I do about things, um, that we have some worth in the social world. So there are people who value my skills and abilities. 
um, that there are people we can rely on. There are people I can count on in an emergency. And then opportunity for us to nurture others. Like there are people who call on me to help them. I want to um, put a little sticky note in your mind about this last one. So I'm going to talk a lot about this tomorrow. So I think um, that opportunities to give support to other people are a really critical and understudied part of social connection. And my good friend and colleague Tristan Inagaki has some really compelling data um, suggesting that giving to others in addition to receiving support for ourselves plays a really critical role in promoting health and well-being. And I'll talk a lot about that tomorrow. Okay, so these are just some details about, about our sample. Um, um, for the most part, people um, reported fairly high levels of social support um, on this scale. Okay, so when we looked at um, the association or the links between inflammation in the body and amygdala reactivity to these threatening faces, um, we found that there was a positive association among the breast cancer survivors. So women who had gone through cancer, who had higher levels of inflammation, showed greater neural activity in the amygdala in response to these threatening social images. So suggesting that breast cancer survivors might have stronger crosstalk between the brain and the immune system, specifically between the amygdala, this key threat-related processing region, and um, levels of inflammatory markers in the blood. But it's not all a sad story because um, we also found evidence that social support can act as a buffer among cancer survivors. So when we looked at associations between social support and amygdala reactivity to these negative threatening images, we found that among the survivors, women who reported having higher levels of social support showed less activity in the amygdala in response to these negative social images compared to um, survivors who showed had less perceived social support. They were the ones who really showed greater activity in the amygdala. A very similar pattern emerged when we looked at the association between social support and levels of inflammation. So among the breast cancer survivors, women who reported high levels of social support were really buffered. They didn't have this high level of inflammation in the body versus survivors who had lower levels of social support showed much higher levels of inflammation. So I think this is super interesting. What I also think is really interesting is that we don't see an association in the controls. So among the women who had never had cancer, there's really not a strong association between social support and amygdala reactivity to threat or among or in levels of inflammation. I think this is intriguing and really potentially some evidence to suggest that it's really the most vulnerable individuals, individuals who are experiencing these negative health conditions who might have you know, anxiety or fear about recurrence of cancer, who are really benefiting from positive social connections and positive social supports. It's not to say that social connection isn't good for people who aren't um, facing difficulties, because certainly it is, but it could be the case that, that social support and social connection is particularly potent and helpful for individuals who are experiencing these negative um, life experiences. So just to sum up, um, we found again that there was a stronger correlation or a stronger association between 
amygdala responses to threat and inflammation among the breast cancer survivors in our study. Um, so maybe some evidence that there's more of a pipeline or more crosstalk between the brain and the immune system among cancer survivors. We also found that among our survivors, higher levels of social support were associated with lower amygdala reactivity to threatening social images and lower levels of inflammation. So potentially uh, a neurobiological mechanism for the effects of social support on cancer outcomes. Maybe this is one of the ways or one of the pathways through which social support can promote positive outcomes among cancer survivors. And like I mentioned before, we didn't find this relationship between social support and amygdala reactivity or inflammation um, among the controls. So suggesting that support may be especially important and helpful for vulnerable individuals. Um, so I don't think it's surprising that social connection is good for us. Um, I think, you know, we've probably all had times in our lives where we felt disconnected and, and lonely. And those are some of the most negative experiences that, that we can have. Um, I think sometimes it is surprising that social connection is as strong of a predictor of health and well-being as it is. Again, over and above smoking. And I don't know about um, in Hong Kong, I would be very curious to hear what you all think. But, but in the U.S., it, you know, we have been very focused on diminishing or eradicating things like smoking and excessive alcohol use. And we've designed lots of interventions to try to target those behaviors. And we've really done nothing to try to promote social connection and to try to diminish loneliness. And if these processes are as important for health and well-being as things like smoking and alcohol use, then I really think we should focus a lot of our efforts at, at intervention and at public health promotion on social connection and getting people to feel more connected and less lonely. How do you do that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have the answer. Maybe someone in here does. I mean, I, there, I know of a couple of studies that have tried to promote um, social connection, and, and it's really hard to do. Um, but tomorrow, I'm going to talk about, about support giving and that this could be one way um, that we could try to get individuals to experience more social connection and that we should think not only about getting support from others as a key mechanism or a key buffer against negative outcomes, but also our need to give to others and to feel like we have these reciprocal meaning, meaningful connections for other people that we're helping and promoting other people's well-being is also a really important part of the process. Um, so I'll get into that tomorrow. Um, and I think we have a few minutes, hopefully I didn't talk the whole time, um, to and talk about your ideas or answer questions. And, and I really hope that you all will come back tomorrow for, for continued discussion. So I'm happy to, to answer questions or to have discussion um, for the next few minutes. So please feel free to. Mm. 
witnessing yeah. um, not to be afraid. Yeah. And also, so basically,
people who are objectively connected but feel lonely, right. and people right. who are objectively disconnected but don't feel lonely, right? And right. thinking about what's going on for those individuals who look isolated but don't feel isolated, and people who look integrated but don't feel integrated. And that really is the power of psychology, right? Where it's all filtered through the, the brain and it's, yeah, not just your objective circumstances, but what you make of them, um, that, that matters a lot. Yeah. Oh, did I see here? <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, this has been really fun. We'll come back tomorrow. We'll have plenty more to talk about. Um, and yeah, thank you. I'm happy to stick around and answer questions here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so finally. We, we are looking forward to hearing more how can we integrate the social neuroscience findings uh, in designing uh, effective intervention to support uh, our mental health practice and in order to support the well-being uh, of the people, especially the vulner vulnerable individuals. And uh, also on behalf of uh, the IIDS team, we greatly appreciate for your support and attendance of everyone. So please give big hands to yourself as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, despite, uh, despite the bad weather. Uh, we hope um, um, you can come again tomorrow and uh, uh, on Saturday morning as well, because tomorrow and uh, evening and also on a Saturday morning, Kili will talk more about how can we designing, how can we design uh, the evidence-based interventions to support our mental health practice based on the social neuroscience findings. Okay, and thank you very much and uh, have a good evening and we will stay here uh, for a while too. So if you have any questions or if you want to chat with Kili, please feel free to come stay here and uh, come down and share, talk to her. Thank you so much. Hãy subscribe cho kênh Ghiền Mì Gõ Để không bỏ lỡ những video hấp dẫn